This is a continuation of our lesson on the different multiplier effects of fiscal policy. In our two previous lessons on fiscal policy, we talked about the different types of policies a government may use in order to either stimulate or contract aggregate demand in the economy with the aim of achieving certain macroeconomic objectives. In our previous lesson, we talked about what is known as the government spending multiplier, or the Keynesian spending multiplier. In that lesson, we explained the difference between marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensity to save, and showed how we could determine the Keynesian spending multiplier, which could also be found by dividing one by the marginal rate of leakage, or one divided by the marginal propensity to save. Now, for IB economic students, the marginal rate of leakage, as we explained, includes the marginal propensity to save, the marginal propensity to import, and the marginal rate of taxation. If you're an AP economic student, you are expected to know the simple Keynesian spending multiplier, which is 1 divided by the marginal propensity to save. Now, today we're going to be talking about how a change in the tax rate in a nation can affect aggregate demand by calculating what's known as the tax multiplier. The tax multiplier is defined as the expected increase in aggregate demand which will result from a particular decrease in taxes. For example, if a government were to lower taxes by $1 billion, how much will this ultimately increase aggregate demand? To determine exactly how much aggregate demand will increase by following a particular decrease in taxes, we must consider the multiplier effect of a cut in taxes. Now, I should point out that the multiplier effect works in both directions. So another question we could answer is how much would aggregate demand decrease by following a $1 billion increase in taxes? When taxes are cut, aggregate demand will increase by a multiple of the amount that the tax cut equaled. On the other hand, if taxes are raised, aggregate demand will fall by a, per a particular multiple of the tax increase. So how do we determine what the tax multiplier is? Let's assume that in a particular country, the marginal propensity to consume is 0.4. This gives us a marginal propensity to save of 0.6. With this information, we can determine how large the tax multiplier will be in a nation. Let's start with an example. Let's say that a government lowers taxes on households by $1 billion. How will this affect household disposable income, and how will it affect the level of consumption and therefore aggregate demand in the economy. A tax cut, unlike an increase in government spending, does not provide direct stimulus to aggregate demand. Rather, it counts on households to increase consumption based on their marginal propensity to consume. So what does happen, though, is that a tax cut leads to an increase in disposable income, which I'll use DI as the abbreviation, of $1 billion. So now households have an additional billion dollars of disposable income. Not all of this will be used to consume, however, since households tend to save 60% of every additional dollar they earn in disposable income. How much will consumption actually increase by? As we see, based on the marginal propensity to consume, consumption will increase by $0.4 billion, while savings increases by $0.6 billion dollars. So as we see, a decrease in taxes increases disposable income. However, aggregate demand will not increase by the full amount of this tax cut, since households have the opportunity to save and consume. In fact, what happens is the $1 billion tax cut leads to only $400 million of new spending. So aggregate demand will only increase by $400 million. Now, this differs from an increase in government spending by the same amount, because as we saw in our previous video lesson, an increase in government spending will directly stimulate aggregate demand, increase household incomes, by $1 billion, which will then lead to further increases in consumption. In this case, however, the $1 billion tax cut only leads to $400 million of new aggregate demand, which turns into new incomes of $400 million, which again will be multiplied by the marginal propensity to consume, so there will be further increases in consumption and aggregate demand. However, the ultimate increase in aggregate demand of a $1 billion cut in taxes will be considerably less than the ultimate increase in aggregate demand resulting from a $1 billion increase in government spending. Now, to actually find the size of the tax multiplier, there's a very simple formula we can use. 
To determine how much aggregate demand will increase following a particular change in taxes, we can find the tax multiplier, which is negative MPC divided by the marginal propensity to save. So why is there a negative sign here? The negative sign indicates that the change in aggregate demand will always be inversely proportional to the change in taxes. So if taxes fall, there will be a negative multiplier, therefore aggregate demand will increase. If taxes rise, there will be a negative multiplier, therefore aggregate demand will decrease. Let's find out exactly how much aggregate demand would rise by following our $1 billion tax cut. So the $1 billion tax cut will lead to a change in aggregate demand of negative 0.4 divided by 0.6, which gives us a multiplier of negative 0.67. What does this mean for the increase in aggregate demand resulting from a $1 billion tax cut? If taxes fall by $1 billion, in other words, taxes change by negative $1 billion, we can multiply this by negative 0.67 to find that the ultimate increase in aggregate demand will only be $670 million. A $1 billion tax cut, when multiplied by the tax multiplier of negative 0.67, will lead to an increase in aggregate demand of $0.67 billion, which is equal to $670 million. How would this compare to the effect of a $1 billion increase in government spending? Well, let's find out what our government spending multiplier would be given a marginal propensity to consume of 0.4 and a marginal propensity to save of 0.6. The spending multiplier, which is k, will equal 1 over 1 minus 0.4, which is 1 over 0.6, which is 1.67. Now, an increase in government spending of 1 billion will lead to 1.67 times 1 billion which is $1.67 billion increase in aggregate demand. A tax cut of $1 billion led to only $670 million of new aggregate demand, whereas a government spending increase of the same amount leads to $1.67 billion of new aggregate demand. As we can see, government spending is more effective at stimulating aggregate demand due to the fact that G is a direct component of aggregate demand, whereas a tax cut does not have a direct effect on aggregate demand. Rather, it is indirect. It increases household disposable income, but some of that increase in income will go towards savings, and a smaller proportion will go towards consumption leading to more aggregate demand. Next, we're going to look at an actual question from an AP economics exam, which asks us to apply both the government spending multiplier and the tax multiplier to a particular situation. So here's an actual advanced placement economics question relating to both the spending and the tax multiplier. Let's read the question and then illustrate the problem that it describes on our graph on the right and then see if we can figure out exactly what the correct answer would be. The question is, assume that current real gross domestic product falls short of full employment output by $500 billion and the marginal propensity to consume is 0.8. Let's look at our graph on the right first and illustrate what the question describes, which is a $500 billion recessionary gap. Now, assuming a marginal propensity to consume of 0.8, we can determine what the government spending multiplier would be. This will help us answer C part I which asks, calculate the minimum increase in government spending that could bring about full employment. So our spending multiplier, K, is 1 divided by 1 minus 0 0.8, which is the marginal propensity to consume, which gives us 1 divided by 0 0.2, which gives us a spending multiplier of 5. Now, how much would government spending have to increase by in order to achieve a $500 billion increase in aggregate demand in order to return this economy to its full employment level? As we learned in our previous lesson, the required change in government spending equals the desired change in aggregate demand divided by the Keynesian spending multiplier. In this case, we know that the desired change in aggregate demand is 500 billion, and the multiplier is 5, giving us an increase in government spending of $100 billion. Now looking at our graph on the right, we can illustrate how a $100 billion increase in government spending will be multiplied and result in a $500 billion increase in aggregate demand. So a government stimulus of only $100 billion will shift AD out to AD1. And as we can see, the immediate effect will be a relatively small increase in national output. However, following the multiplier effect of this government spending, 
aggregate demand will shift out by a full $500 billion, and this economy should return to a level of output equal to its full employment level. So here we see that the increase in government spending leads to an increase in AD, but then due to the multiplier effect, we get a much larger increase in aggregate demand in the end. Now there's still a second part to this question. So look at part two of this question. Assume that instead of increasing government spending, the government decides to reduce personal income taxes. Will the reduction in personal income taxes required to achieve full employment be larger than or smaller than the government spending change you calculated in Part CI? Explain why. To help us answer this question, it might help to actually determine what the tax multiplier is. Now we can solve for the tax multiplier using the equation we learned previously, which is negative MPC over the marginal propensity to save. Now we know that this nation's households will spend 80% of any change in income, so we assume that they will save the other 20%. So negative MPC over MPS equals negative 0.8 over 0.2, which is negative 4. In order to find the needed change in taxes, all we have to do is divide the desired change in aggregate demand by the tax multiplier. In this case, once again, our desired change in aggregate demand is 500 billion, and now our tax multiplier is negative 4. 500 billion divided by negative 4 gives us the result of negative 125. What does this tell us? This tells us that taxes must fall by $125 billion. Notice that the $100 billion increase in government spending could bring about a $500 billion increase in aggregate demand. However, if we decide to cut taxes, a $125 billion tax cut will be needed. This will increase households' disposable income, which will lead to an increase in consumption. However, the tax cut needed is quite a bit larger than the government spending increase that would bring about the same change in aggregate demand. This is because a tax cut is an indirect injection into the nation's economy. And in fact, due to the marginal propensity to consume of 0.8, a $125 billion tax cut will actually only lead to an increase in consumption of $100 billion since 20% of that tax cut will go towards savings. Let's wrap up our lesson now by reviewing what we've talked about. The marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensities to save, or if you're an IB student, the marginal rate of leakage, helps us determine what the government spending multipliers and the tax multipliers will be. By understanding how aggregate demand will change following a change in government spending or a change in taxes, we can help determine an appropriate fiscal policy response to a particular recessionary gap or, in the case of demand pull inflation, an inflationary gap. If an economy is experiencing demand pull inflation, the multiplier effect works in the opposite direction as well. So a particular increase in taxes will reduce aggregate demand by more than the initial increase in taxes or a particular decrease in government spending will decrease aggregate demand by more than the initial decrease in spending.